That was wonderful, Nancy. I've heard her speak before about this issue and um, at the um, American Chemical Society, I think, a couple of years ago. And it always uh, just uh, makes you realize what we're doing at the large scale. Anyway, I'm Joan Rose. Um, I'm a professor at Michigan State University. Um, I won the Clark Prize in 2001. Wow, that <laughs> seems like a long time ago. Um, I'm very happy to be here and uh, uh, see everyone again, and especially have, I enjoyed having lunch with the students. Um, well, I'm going to chair the session um, this afternoon, and we have, I think uh, Pedro must be sitting in the audience so he can watch the presentation, so we'll get you up later. Um, we have two presentations, um, and our first um, is uh, Joe uh, uh, Grinstaff, and uh, he is the general manager of the Inland Empire Utilities Agency. You know, I was looking at his bio, uh, and he's had 30 years of experience in California, but not just that, because he's been the general manager of a number of different districts of various sizes with various problems, I think, if you if you looked at the Monte Vista, Santa Ana, he was the chief deputy director of the California Department of Water Resources, so he's had experience there. Um, executive officer of the Delta Stewardship Council. I think uh, what he's doing now is quite interesting, and especially for this session, addressing the challenges of urban water sustainability, uh, because he's leading his agency really in um, the uh, reuse, uh, in the reuse of water, and not just water, but biosolids as well. So the whole idea of this recycling um, and philosophy to, to meet sustainability goals. And so, Joe, thank you very much. Oh, let's see. Where's the, let's see, where's the, oh, there it is. Can she start it there? Wow, this is well organized, isn't it? She just clicked one click and here it came. Uh, thanks, it's, I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Let me first tell you a little bit about Inland Empire Utilities Agency, kind of who we are. We're the, a uh, wholesale agency that does water and wastewater for the west end of San Bernardino County. So for those of you not from LA, it borders on LA County, Orange County, and Riverside County. And we, uh, we're, uh, we have about 850,000 people. Last number I saw was 855 or something. And we're still growing a lot. I think something like 40% of the people that live there go to work in LA or Orange County. So it's a, a bedroom community in many ways, but we also have some significant industries. So we have what remains uh, what's uh, California steel, what was once, once Kaiser steel. So we have a number of things in our region. And I want to talk some about the values that we as an agency have. Our board has for a long time been committed to sustainability and um, resilience. So that includes biosolids. Uh, we have five wastewater plants, and from those we generate a lot of sludge. But rather than ship it off to Arizona, which I think we did at one time, we actually built a uh, compost facility, an indoor compost facility, which is the largest in the Americas. And all of our sludge is composted and reused locally uh, and it's part of the commitment to, to make sure that what we have is actually reused. We do it with um, trying to pay attention to the dollars so we don't just spend whatever it costs, but we think we can achieve that objective while also being responsible um, with cost. Um, another example would be on the power side where we have solar and wind and uh, the largest uh, digester gas fuel cell in the world, as far as I know, and uh, also have uh, engines that we run with methane. So we, uh, the, the, and the board has a policy of trying to be independent during peak times so that we're not a drain on the system. And ultimately, we think we can get to a place where we actually are self-sufficient in terms of energy. So kind of with that background, I want to talk a little bit about the expectations. You all know that we're in drought here in California. 
We're expecting that our, our, our wholesale supplier, Metropolitan Water District, is going to implement a water supply allocation plan sometime in the next few months, which means rationing. So we expect maybe on the order of a 10% uh, cutback for everybody. That's uh, a major issue uh, for us and something that I think actually is helpful as we plan for the future. We're in the middle of updating virtually all of our plans, our wastewater plan, our recycled water plan, our energy plan, our, our water supply plan. So uh, trying to tie that all together in this environment's been really challenging and interesting. Where are we with water? About 70% of our water supply is local right now. So we have, when it rains, we have some surface water even that comes into the area. We have groundwater and we import water from Northern California uh, into the area, about 30% of our supply. And that's the part of our supply that's under the most stress. But honestly, droughts impact local supplies too and impact groundwater basins. And so we've recently been in a discussion, our, our water master's been in discussions with all the producers about what is the real safe yield, what's it been over the last 10 years because it's been a relatively dry 10 years. That's a challenge uh, moving ahead. We're expecting to grow. I think on this slide we say 1.1 million people by 2040, but it, we're not sure how much it will be. We have one development in our region that's expecting to add about 200,000 people just in that one single development um, in the southern part of our area. So it's significant challenge growing with limited supply and trying to find a way to be sustainable and resilient. If we just did what we've done in the past, the water supply requirements for the agency would go up from 232,000 acre feet to around 323,000 acre feet. That's not sustainable, but we have to find a way to supply water so that we can have the economy that we all want to have and that, that has lots of implications for us moving ahead. One of our fundamental principles is that it's really uncertain. So I've been, I pay attention. I hear scientists fairly routinely now talk about the fact that stationarity is dead. Uh, and I'm not sure that it was really ever alive. Uh, but certainly as a water manager, and as you heard, I've managed water agencies before. The typical thing to do has been to say, well, what's been going on for the last 10 years or the last 20 years or the last 50 years and assume that's what's going to happen in the future? Well, one of my great concerns is that may not be what happens in the future. What if the future looks more like this current year than uh, like the 50 years we had the last half of the 20th century and what are the consequences. So as we plan, one of our key objectives is figure out what we can do to set it up so that we're resilient and so that managers that follow me and, and boards that come after our board will be able to make wise choices and have options for supply. So. There are lots of, lots of parts, and I'll just talk about a few of the key things. I think probably the most key things uh, that we want to do. One of the key objectives we have is to reduce our dependence on state water project water. That's the, that's the imported water from Northern California. And that's hard because, as you saw, we're already dependent and we're going to grow. There's significant growth anticipated and it's clearly the desire for our communities to continue to grow, to allow that to happen. Second major object objective is to maximize recycled water use. And we're well on the way towards doing that. 
but there's still more to do. We've invested about $250 million in building a recycled water system, and about a third of our recycled water now gets recharged into the ground and uh, therefore is available as groundwater, and about two-thirds is used for direct use. For, for We still have some agricultural customers in the area, but mostly it's for direct use, whether it's parks or golf courses or, or landscape irrigation, or in some cases, process water. Uh, we, use, uh, we use our recycled water, and we plan to use virtually all that we can generate, and in fact, we're in the process of negotiating with member agencies. And I'm going to show you some graphics here in a minute that talks about what the alternatives are. One of the things we're very interested in doing is working with our neighbors. So we're part of the Santa Ana watershed. So we have, there's a river that runs here in, in Southern California. We're part of that watershed, and we don't think that we can really be successful if it's just us, if it's just our district, our seven cities, and our seven water, eight, nine, ten water agencies, uh, if, if just our agencies are successful, we don't think that's a sustainable strategy. So what we have to do is actually find a way to work with everybody else and, and help them uh, have a sustainable strategy and have a regional strategy that works for everybody. So the region, the watershed-wide conjunctive use program is one that's intended to actually help us all work together um, so that we're all able in dry years to get through those years and so that in wet years we can take deliveries of more water. And then the last one, which in some ways is the most controversial, although maybe the most logical that everybody would, probably everybody in this room would say, of course you ought to do this, uh, reducing demands, conserving more water. That's, that's controversial if you're in a water agency because your revenues go down. And uh, we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. So, recycled water use. Our intent is to maximize direct connections, uh, first of all. And take what we try and do is take all of the water that uh, we can't directly use and recharge that into the ground. And right now there are a few months in the winter time, if it's wet, when we can't recharge everything, but other, otherwise we think that that program uh, will be successful. Recently we've actually realized that we have more demand than we have water. So we're in the process of negotiating with neighboring agencies to acquire their recycled water because in most cases agencies haven't invested the money that's necessary to make a recycled water system really work. It's not a cheap thing to do, it's not something you can do overnight. You have to really invest money and work hard to get it done. So one of the things we're, we have an MOU with one neighboring agency to develop a system and an agreement for transferring recycled water, and we're, we're talking to another agency. Long term, it's water. So we're going to do that. Conservation. Um, when you look at this, you can see that we have a significant amount of irrigation demands in our in our region. So our in, internal water use is about 55 gallons per person per day. Not really bad, not maybe wonderful, but it's it's not bad at least in a Southern California perspective. But we have an awful lot of irrigation demands, and so we think we have a lot of opportunity here to improve water use efficiency and reduce those demands, and we think that's a key part of what we have to do uh, as we move ahead. Now, the process we're going through is one that involves uh, water supply scenarios. So when you look up there, if we just kind of went ahead with what we've been doing, here's what we would do. We would import more water. Uh, and that's the big red arrow up there at the top of the, uh, top of the graphic. And the, the little green arrow there on the left, that's water conservation. That's kind of where we're at today. And if we didn't do anything else, we just kept, kept moving, this is where we'd be. And uh, we don't think that's sustainable. And as I talked to you, talked about before, our board is very committed to having some sustainability, to being reliable for 
for future generations. And and I've, as, as you heard, I've worked on Delta issues. All of our Northern California water comes through the California Delta, and it's not something that we want to count on increasing as time goes by. So this this alternative here is what's called a balanced alternative. If you asked most of our our member agencies, this is probably what they would prefer because it leaves uh, imports close to where they are today. Right now we import about 60,000 acre feet a year, round numbers, and so this leaves imports there and does a little bit more conservation. We meet the the law, there's a state law that says we have to reduce, uh, we have to improve efficiency, um, reduce per capita use by 20% by 2020. So this, this actually meets that state law. And the other thing it does is it keeps the revenues for our member agencies intact. And, and for them, that's a really big issue. We've recently been going out and meeting with all of them. Oh, what should we do? And this is what we think. And, and for them, even the, the, the rationing that's coming, coming this, probably coming this next year, obviously the weather could change. But that's a really big issue. So what do they do as an institution if they haven't got rates in place that will sustain them if water sales drop by 20 or 30 percent? That's a huge issue that many agencies, many local, especially smaller agencies, just haven't dealt with. Here's, here's another alternative where we focus on water supply locally. It's, um, again, maximizing recycled water. You notice it does not increase conservation a whole lot. It leaves it kind of at the, it meets the minimum requirements for the 20 by 2020 uh, law, uh, but it does the direct deliveries of, of water from the north are reduced and most of those deliveries are actually delivered to the groundwater so you could take the water out in, um, in dry years. That comes closer to a, a more sustainable uh, program. Here's an alternative, and I'm, I'm, I, know, I know this may be boring, but I want to make the point we have all of these scenarios none of them are exactly what's going to happen and none of them will make everybody happy but we have to plan and we have to figure out where are we going to make our investments so on this alternative we're talking about increasing the amount of um, conservation so th this is a significant change probably means less sales for our member agencies um, we also, and I haven't talked about it here, but one of our strategies is stormwater capture, and we've we've invested uh, somewhere around $100 million in that, and we probably have about another $100 million to go. We actually have a, an agreement with our local flood control agency, and we uh, operate the flood control basins for the purposes of capturing stormwater, and we use those same basins for capturing recycled water that we percolate into the ground. So we, we have that program and the plan is to expand that. Uh, it's not a huge amount of water, but it's, it's significant moving ahead. So this alternative decreases the amount of water that we take from the state project though significantly as you can see. And um, that, that uh, one, one other reason why that makes local agencies nervous, we have probably invested half a billion dollars in surface water treatment plants to take deliveries of Northern California water. So if we say in the future we're going to decrease taking that water, then all those member agencies that have invested all of that money feel like they would have to explain to their board members and the public why have we invested in this if in fact that's not going to be a big source of, of, of water supply as we move ahead. Here's, here's the really big one that really scares them. And this is a 40% reduction from where we were five years ago. The, the law uh, said we had to do 20%. And the truth is here, 
we have this, these imports, but we actually have water being able to be exported out of the region. And this, this, the amount of water that we use in this alternative ends up being something on, in the range of 140 gallons per person per day. So um, to me, that actually doesn't sound bad. That seems like that might be a reasonable number given the climate of where we live, given, uh, given the fact that we want to have an environment, we don't want all of the landscaping to die. We want to have trees. We want to have a, a nice place to live, but it might be something that's doable. Uh, I mean, in, in Melbourne, their per capita daily usage now is consistently 45. And obviously, it's a different climate, but they, the, the drought drove them to change things, and those changes appear to be being held on to. People appear to continue to be living uh, with a much reduced water supply. So, and having been to Melbourne, it's a wonderful city. Our region could probably maybe not live on 45 because I don't, we have to irrigate some of our plant, our landscaping. We have to do some of those things. Uh, but we don't have to do uh, everything that we've always done. Now, these are all draft scenarios, by the way. There are, there are some problems with this. If you reduce water use on landscaping significantly, that bottom arrow coming up from groundwater probably has to get a little bit smaller because you're reducing the amount of water that goes into the ground. And I don't think in this scenario they, actually, they didn't take full account of that. But when you, when you they're working to improve these scenarios, uh, we're in that process now. And that process is, we have somebody here in the audience, and I'm sorry I've forgotten your name, that works for the company that's working with us on developing our integrated resources plan, which is where these graphics come from. And he was saying, I'm hearing that it's also political. Of course it's political. We have 850,000 people with uh, seven elected boards for, for different cities, seven city councils, and lots of people who worry about their quality of life. And, and they don't want some bureaucrat, I'm a bureaucrat, bureaucrat in their definition, uh, to tell them that they have to change the way they live. Uh, and, and so we have to figure out how we can move ahead. It's actually clear to me that if it remains dry, even the amount of conservation we have here may be not nearly as much as we actually do. And now that's really scary. So inherent in developing our integrated resources plan is not just doing the, the planning of this number, but then saying, well, how will we support people to transform their landscapes so that they are more California friendly, so that it looks like California can look. Still very beautiful, green, wonderful place to be, but not necessarily full of ornamental turf. Uh, so. We have to help people transition there. We have to help our member agencies, who are all these retailers, figure out what they do with, uh, with pricing, how they can have sustainable rate structures that allow them to continue to operate and maintain the water utility as they move ahead. And we have to figure out how we communicate with the public about all of, all of that stuff because conservation, as I say, it may be the most controversial part of the plan. And, and so that's, that's the challenge. So I was going to talk about what are the challenges as you're trying to develop a sustainable plan. I believe something like this is sustainable. Actually, probably the one before is sustainable. Uh, the real art is trying to figure not just the numbers, but how do you how do the communities buy in? How do the people buy in to that? So uh, these are some of the scenarios for gallons per capita per day. You can see where, where they're at. And I won't spend too much time on these. Uh, I do want to say that as we look at our water portfolio over time, the 30% here in this white pie chart is where we want to be, 30 or 40% water conservation. And as I tell my staff, 
None of these numbers are right. These are planning numbers. But what this is is going to set the direction, help us decide what investments to make. We're going to invest in recycled water. We're going to invest in stormwater capture. We're going to invest in things. We're going to invest in water conservation. And when we do all of those things, they'll come back and recalibrate in five years and say, well, we need to do more or we need to do change slightly our direction. And that's the challenges and the opportunities. So thank you very much. Stay up here, Joe. I'm sure there's going to be some, some questions. Yes, thanks. So I'm kind of interested in the relatively large reliance on direct recycling of water as opposed to groundwater replenishment. It seems like a lot of the utilities, for example, Orange County or the South Bay Water Recycling Project in San Jose, have looked at these direct projects and seen that it results in an increased reliance on landscape irrigation and it ha suffers from problems of building and maintaining a large purple pipe water distribution system. So are there attributes of Inland Empire that make it different and make direct recycling of water as opposed to potable water reuse, either direct potable reuse or groundwater recharge, uh, more attractive? Yeah, there are a couple of things there. One part of, in order to do the recharge of water, uh, we had to build almost the same system that we built, but it costs less to build one that uses, that does direct, uh, direct use uh, than it does to do one that, that moved all of the water into the basins. We didn't have the basins. I think we think ultimately the most recycled water we could percolate would be 34,000 acre feet a year. That's in 30 or 40 years if we had that much. We don't have that much that we could use uh, now. Uh, and so in order to maximize recycled water, uh, this was the plan they came up with. That said, if I had a choice, I would, I would probably go for indirect because it is simpler to manage. Trying to manage the hundreds of users and balance a system, it's, it's operating a whole new water system and that, that's, uh, that's a challenge. The other thing that's there is we have member agencies that had all signed agreements with us so each of the member agencies wanted water delivered to them uh, and so that politics is always, you know, that plays into why those decisions were made. There's a question. Yeah, I think right back here. Hi, uh, with your recycled water, basically it's kind of a closed loop where you're capturing most of it and you're talking about aggressive conservation. Have you started talking about focusing on outdoor conservation versus indoor, which is basically a supply? Yes, one of, one of the challenges is salt balance. And I didn't mention that, but we actually operate a uh, groundwater desalter there, and, and long-term salt balance is a really big issue for us. So we, we, we have to manage that very carefully. We, want, we don't want to hurt our aquifer in the long term by choosing to do what is in short term, what short term uh, would be the least expensive thing. We want to look at what's the right thing long term. So yes. There are, there are challenges with doing that, and, and we have to bring water in from the outside to some extent. Right now, one of the challenges, we do have some, the, the region originally was agriculture, and there were both um, lots of citrus, and there were lots of grapes, and then they switched over, and we had the largest concentration of dairy animals in the world in the Chino Basin. So we have huge water quality issues that we have to manage while we're doing all of these things. So I said it was more complicated than what I was presenting here. It is much more complicated. There's, we have, you know, if you add the water supply stuff that comes in, our agency, the wholesaler, we have a $200 million a year budget. It's, um, it, so there's lots of com complexities in doing it. But as I say, the most, the most controversial thing is, do we really have to use less water? And, uh, and what, what happens with all of the retail agencies' budgets if, if we do that? And
Okay, thank okay, you. Thank you. Good job.